Hi, Megan. Hey, Sarah. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I had the funniest thing. Well, it's kind of fun and scary thing <laughs> happen. So as you know, my girls love to play with face paint and oh, I yes. have scour. <laughs> yes, they love it. They're super artistic. I think they see me doing makeup and they have their own play makeup sets, but face paint is a little more their vibe right now with their ages. They like mm -hmm. to do like animals and fun things like that. Um, and I had scoured everywhere, all everywhere online to find them natural, non-toxic face paint. Mm -hmm. And we found some really great ones and we love them. And then um, my daughter was gifted another set of face paints just from someone with very good intentions. It's a beautiful oh, set. Okay. Um, and I, I didn't notice that it is not non-toxic and she was really excited to use it oh. and she wanted to use it on me. Oh, oh no. <laughs> and we, were, we were having a day at home and I was like, yeah, let's go for it. This will be a fun memory. Mm -hmm. So we were sitting outside and I let her face paint my face and then my three-year-old got involved and my whole face looked like what you could imagine. Oh. Just like... <laughs> Face paint everywhere, and I hope that they will cherish this moment forever. Wait, do you have a picture? Yes, oh, I have a few pictures. You guys send it to me. <laughs> okay, That's I will. So funny. It was a lot, and I was like, "Wow, I'm giving myself mom props right now because this uh -huh. is a lot." <laughs> but I kept it on for the day because for a couple hours because we were mm -hmm. just playing outside, and they thought it was so funny. And I was like, totally in mom mode. Like I'm a mom right now. We're having fun. Nothing else matters. Yeah. Um. But thank goodness they didn't paint their own face, uh, their own faces because they were playing with other things. And the next morning, I woke up with a rash all over one side of my face. Oh and no! Yes, and I didn't put two and two together like right away. I was like, oh my gosh, did I some of my skincare? Like, did I use yeah. too much of a retinol product? Like, what is going on? And I kept looking at it, and I was like, this is so strange. And then the picture, I looked at the pictures of where my face was painted. And of course, right where there was really heavy face paint was the exact outline of the rash. Oh, no. And I grabbed the set and I started reading all the information about it. And, yeah. you know, with the best intentions, someone gifted this to us and it is just full of of toxins. Thank goodness my girls didn't put it on their face. Oh. And it just is so crazy to me that this is allowed to be on the market, but it went away within 24 hours. Um, okay. It, it was just a, <laughs> a funny, a funny little uh, event that happened for us. Oh my gosh. And a total reminder to always check ingredients before you use anything that we haven't yes. researched ourselves. It's, exactly. I was like, uh, oh my God, it's a good thing. Cause I mean, if I put this on my older skin, what would right. it have, you know, I wonder what it would have done on six year old or three year old skin. I know. Isn't that I crazy? Know. And it came That's in crazy. this really beautiful packaging. It looks high end. Aww. And it's interesting because the non toxic ones that I bought them, they come in recycled packaging. They mm -hmm. look pretty low end because it's just okay. kind of this flimsy recycled cardboard. Right. And it's interesting if you hold the two products next to each other, the one with the toxic ingredients looks much more luxe. It looks much mm. more enticing. Um, we were really excited to receive this gift, but the ingredients are not there. So it's just so interesting how packaging and components and everything mm -hmm. that goes around with it can like give you the opinion that a product is something that it's not. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. I know yeah. all the clean things that I see out there that I would like my kids to be using. I do notice the packaging is just a little bit neutral and not as much fun looking. So it's, it's tough to find one that fits the bill, but I know. So how are you? What's going yeah. on with you this week? Oh, I'm good. We, you know, we have all three of our kids back into school and the illnesses are going around, unfortunately. Oh. And I, I'm sure you, you know this, but um, yes. my eldest got sick and it was supposed to be her birthday party. So last minute I was, texting probably 25 people saying, don't come to our house. Um, we have some sickness going around in our house and had to postpone it. So she was 
very sad initially, but ended up, um, she did a, a lemonade stand with one of her friends instead. And uh, she was able to raise money for uh, fire victims in Maui and things like that. So I was really proud of her for turning it around and uh, just still being able to do something with her time that was um, fun. So I, I was just really proud of her for, for doing that. I thought that was a really sweet, sweet way to trade out a birthday party for doing something nice for somebody else. Um, yeah, that's yeah. so sweet. I know. It's just like such a hard pill to swallow when you're that age and your family is sick. And I know when you texted I me, I was like, oh my gosh, because it was a birthday party for the school class right yeah, not just your really close class. friends yeah so you had a lot of people and people that you don't know that well <laughs> I know I and know then and food being delivered and yes. cupcakes right yeah and a lifeguard that was the one piece <laughs> of uh that that was a la- the last thread I had not wrapped up was I forgot to tell the lifeguard not to come to our house because it was a pool party so for safety reasons we had a lifeguard just to of keep course. watch I forgot to tell him, so he <laughs> showed up for the party. <laughs> oh, husband, no. I know. My husband answered the door, and he's like, uh, the party's been postponed. My wife will get back to you. Oh. So I'm like, can you please come back this other day? So it, it worked out. It was fine. Um, and to be clear, she wasn't the one that was sick at the time, but now she's caught it. So it's just oh. it's just one thing after the other. So I know. I, know. Like, I feel like that gracious. is just like back to school and back to – germs. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's so sad, but I guess it's part of going to school. So yes, we'll just get through this time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, welcome everyone to Platinum Perspective, the podcast about beauty, psychology, travel, luxury, and more. I'm your co-host, Sarah. And I'm Megan. Sarah and I are best friends who put the work in to get the most out of life so you don't have to. Today, I am super, 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 super excited because we are going to get into the fascinating world of psychology with Dr. Megan. (laughs) (laughs) So Megan is a clinical psychologist who taught at the university level for a number of years. She would have upwards of 200 students at a time per semester. Is that right, Megan? Yeah, that's right. a lot. Yeah. (laughs) And while she mainly lectured on child psychology for upperclassmen, she was also selected to teach a specialized course in London for for students studying abroad. Thousands of students voted for which teacher they wanted to teach, and Megan was selected. Yay! It was a Um, lot of fun. It was an awesome trip. Well, how amazing that it was in London. I know. <laughs> That's why I applied to be an instructor. <laughs> I was like, I, w- I want to go. Sure, send me. It was awesome. Uh, yeah. I love it. Well, yeah. I'm so excited for today's topic because I don't know much about psychology and I love learning about it. Um, yeah. So let's do some rapid fire. Okay. Are you ready? ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, number one, what is the most surprising thing you learned in grad school? So... One of the most surprising things I think uh, coming into school was that you're taught not to trust your gut when it comes to diagnosing. And this is surprising because we do trust our gut on a lot of other things, but not when it comes to diagnosis because uh, there are a lot of mistakes made when you trust your gut rather than following a sort of standardized assessment process. So I'm taught more on the empirically supported way, which is using um, a very like regimented, rigid assessment process. The other interesting thing, so there's a lot of like tidbits of information that you get throughout grad school that's like strange and quirky. And the other bit of information that I got uh, or advice I got was never, ever sit next to a trash can. And the, I know. the reason That's so is, random. I know it's so <laughs> random. The reason is that there are theories that the person who sits closest to the trash can has the lowest self-esteem. So uh, <laughs> we'd come into class and there's a trash can in the corner and you could see there's eight of us in the class. We'd all try to sit as far away from the trash can as possible for, before our professor would come in um, so that we weren't <laughs> perceived to have the lowest self-esteem. It's silly. 
That's so random. Although yeah. I would, I would never sit near one because you just no. think they smell. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, I'll never do it. That's so funny. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that was a little more than three to five words. Sorry, but... <laughs> I'll, I'll censor myself. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Next question for rapid fire: Do you believe in Freudian slips? Oh no, total bunk. Okay. Really? Oh, mm-hmm. okay. I want to get into Freud a little bit later because you've mentioned a few things on that. But yeah. um, let's do our last rapid fire. Are there any skills you teach your clients that you use yourself? Yes, definitely. I'll talk more about it, but there are a lot of skills that I teach clients about that I also use myself in everyday settings. Okay. Mm-hmm. Ooh, okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, okay. So to kick things off, let's start with the basics. What exactly is psychology and why is it so important? Yeah. So psychology is the scientific study of uh, the mind and behavior. And it's all about understanding why we think, feel, act, behave in ways that we do and how it impacts our relationships from personal development and things like that, and how we interact with other people in our world. Okay. And how is that different from psychiatry? So psychiatry is similar. We would get more about, so remember how I was talking about, we use such a regimented assessment process and things like that. Psychologists are really good at teasing apart different symptoms for diagnostics. And then when we have a diagnosis, we then select a treatment and the treatment is not medicine. The treatment we'd be using is um, a different sort of therapy or exposure or things like that, that we are trained in. We are not trained in the medical practice of, um, of prescribing. So mm-hmm. unless you're in a couple of states, I think Louisiana was one of them. Um, you can take a couple extra classes and you can start to prescribe medicine as it, as it pertains to uh, a mental health um, diagnosis. But other than that, we don't diagnose. We do diagnose, but we do not um, prescribe medication when it comes to uh, treating. So we would just be okay. doing like this cognitive behavioral therapy, things like that. If you have a diagnosis where you need medicine, so for instance, if you have somebody who's got depression, uh, the front line gold standard therapy for that is uh, medicine plus therapy. So the medicine part would need to come from your psychiatrist. The therapy part would need to come from me or a psychologist who's got that sort of training and that background. Oh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. I never really um, knew that before. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. So can we start a little bit with the foundation? So I know no discussion on psychology would be complete without mentioning Freud. Um, So even though I know from past episodes that you have really strong opinions about him, which I love your strong opinions, (laughs) um, I don't know that much about him other than he's referenced in psychology. So would you just briefly share, like, what did he believe and why do you hate him? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just to clarify, I, I don't hate him. I He is actually one of the forefathers, one of the big forefathers of my discipline. So, like, props to him. He had some major theories. Uh, he sort of put psychology out on, you know, the world stage. People started learning about what it is and and honing it and making it better. But so in the late 19th century, uh, Freud started his uh, career as a a neurologist and he was doing research on the nervous system. Uh, He became an expert in cerebral palsy and published lots of influential papers on that topic. And then uh, in the 1880s, he started to shift his attention more towards the mind and what he described as unconscious processes. So these are things that are occurring in our brains that he, this is a theory that we actually don't have access to. Uh, but through work with a psychologist, the psychologist would then be able to access these unconscious thoughts mm-hmm. and motivations that are happening in your brain. Um, so yeah, he had this belief in unconscious thoughts and emotions and that those unconscious untapped pieces of your brain are actually playing a significant role in mental health and behavior. So, oh, wow. That's yeah. giving a lot of power to the psychologist. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that's one of my, my major, I mean, I'll go through it in a second, like my major problems with this, but 
the idea that a psychologist would be able to access those, but you can't yourself, uh, there's not a lot of research to support this. And it's an interesting idea, uh, but it's, it's also just not, uh, it's not really spurring am like amazing therapy either, right? So like mm -hmm. the therapy for if you're going to go to somebody who's sort of psychoanalysis trained, which is sort of like the, the therapy that people who are trained in like the Freudian um, orientation, that's the sort of therapy they'd be providing. That takes a really long time. The therapy lasts sometimes for years. And uh, that's just like not very helpful when somebody's got an immediate problem. You want something that is empirically supported, that's been researched, that multiple research groups have found that this therapy is the best therapy and that it works the fastest. I don't know about you, but when I need therapy or when I want medicine or something, I've got the flu, I don't want something that's going to take forever to treat it. I want to treat it right now and I want it to go quickly. Yes. So that's the big problem, I would say, with the, the Freudian yeah. stance. The interesting thing about the Freudian stance is that it still persists today in some of the top-notch research and university settings. So there are still people, despite the fact that there's not a lot of research to support this orientation, that use it all the time and still teach it in and like universities like Yale, Harvard, psychoanalysis oh, really? is still really big. Yeah. So wow. it's really strange because it's also not the new wave. The new wave of therapy is sort of the way I was trained, which is in cognitive behavioral um, orientation. So um, that's totally different than this. But it's it's surprising that without a ton of research that this other sort of, I don't know, hokey pokey uh, orientation still is being taught to students. That's crazy. That's I know. really interesting. Um, yeah. okay, you mentioned how what you're doing is so different. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? How does what you do differ from that? Because that yeah. does seem wacko. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so instead of me thinking there's something that I can access because I have this amazing training and I can I have access to these thoughts that you could you don't even notice. I say that's bunk. My um, orientation is cognitive behavioral, which means you have thoughts and you have feelings and you as the patient, you have access to those. So that I'm not, I'm not um, here to be a detective and figure out what thoughts and feelings you have. You know what those are, but that those thoughts and feelings are inter interrelated and that they are going to be um, sometimes dysfunctional, which can lead to outcomes like a mental health disorder that's treatable. Mm -hmm. Now, because that's my orientation and I say you have, you know, we understand that these thoughts are related to emotions, emotions and thoughts are related to behavior. Then we can say that there are places where you can intervene. The places you intervene are cognitive, the way you're thinking, behavioral, what you're doing. And once you're able to access that and you're able to intervene on one of those pieces, you can change that dysfunctional sort of cycle and you can have a treatment um, that is spe specific for that. Um, that. That's so empowering. Like yeah. That makes so much more sense to me that you're empowering someone to change their own life, to become a healthier version of themselves. Yeah. The nice thing too, is that those are both variables that researchers can assess, right? Like we can say, ask you, how are you feeling? What are you thinking? You can access those things and there is data there to research. There's not a lot of data there. If you're saying, well, you have an unconscious process that we can't really tap into. Like, how do you actually even research that then how is that researchable yeah. <laughs> you know so this is a this is something that's been so widely researched there are thousands of papers validating the cognitive behavioral approach for a multitude of disorders um, and so because of that I like it because I want the gold standard I want somebody who's researched it I want multiple groups to have researched it and said yes there it's a goal-oriented approach we're going to have a goal in mind once we reach that goal therapy's over we don't need to be in therapy forever, right? Like that, there's no reason for that. Um, mm -hmm. And so because of that, when you, you know, use your insurance, for instance, to go access your mental health care, you're going to get about 12 to 14 sessions. And that's because that's generally how long it takes for cognitive behavioral therapy to mm -hmm. do its thing. So they know that we know that. that so go do that. So um, oh, 
Yeah. So yeah, okay. it's, it's in general, it's just a, a more accessible therapy um, for most people, I would say, and makes a lot that more sense. That makes sense. sense. Mm-hmm. Okay. I love that. That makes so much sense. So you said in the intro that um, you use some of the skills that you teach your patients. And I'm really interested in that. Like, will you elaborate on that? And which ones do you use the most? So Yes, I do use a lot of different skills that I teach my clients for sure. One big one that I love, I love the skills included in dialectical behavior therapy. So it's, um, we call it DBT. It's a comprehensive and evidence-based psychotherapy that originated from Dr. Marsha Linehan back in the 1980s. Um, And it was originally designed to treat individuals who had borderline personality disorder, a condition marked by emotional dysregulation, unstable relationships, impulsive behaviors. However, DBT has been adapted and proven um, to be effective with uh, treating a wide variety of mental health conditions, including mood disorders, self-harm behavior, substance use, eating disorders. And the reason it's so versatile is that at the crux of it, it focuses a lot on mindfulness, which you've probably heard that term thrown around quite a bit. It's very popular now to do mindfulness exercises, and people are very attuned now to what mindfulness is. And a lot of that credit goes back to Dr. Linehan for um, talking a lot about that and how important it is to be present in the present moment and participate in the present moment fully. And I think where this uh, orientation becomes very interesting is that it's it's based in sort of Eastern religion ideas where two opposing things can be true at the same time. And that's the dialectic. So one thing you notice about people is that um, when they have a difficult relationship with somebody, maybe say it's their parents, and they have had really bad experiences with their parents. And also, and notice I say and rather than but, that's part of the dialectics, and they love their parent. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, you can have this sort of relationship with a lot of things. The thing is, is that the bad things happened as well as you love that person. And it's okay to feel both ways at the same time. Where we see a lot of emotional dysregulation come from is when people feel like either one or the other has to be true. And that causes a lot of distress because both are true at the same time within that individual. And then a lot of shame occurs because of that. I like this because I think it's very freeing to think to yourself that I can have multiple feelings about the same thing at the same time, and that's totally fine. And I love that. Wow. Um, oh, yeah. That's so interesting. And that makes so much sense. But I wonder why. I mean, I that hadn't occurred to me before that you can have multiple feelings about one thing. Like usually you think something is bad or something is good. Yeah, exactly. And for people who have borderline personality disorder, a lot of times in their history, if you look back, there is some form of abuse or there's something traumatic that's occurred and they've grown up and now they are having a really hard time interacting with their environment in so many different ways. And it's because they have this emotional turmoil of this bad thing happened and I feel this way at the same time. And at least that's one component of it. And so allowing people the freedom to accept those feelings and those emotions can be very freeing for them to be able to just embrace who they actually are rather than fight it all the time. But there's a lot of amazing skills that are taught that are so concrete in in DBT. And I just think it's amazing for everybody, basically, whether you have a mental health problem or not. Um, if you just, you know, use some of these skills, like number one, obviously the big one is mindfulness. So teaching people to be aware of their thoughts and aware of their emotions, then their sensations and be non-judgmental about them. We judge ourselves so much and we don't need to, no one else is doing that besides ourselves. And so if we judge ourselves that much, then it just brings a lot of, you know, harm to ourselves. We don't need to be so judgmental. Um, and, then, and then can I ask a question on that? Yeah. How do we ensure that we're being the right amount of mindfulness? So obviously being mindful takes a lot more cognitive effort. It does. So there's especially, you know, if you're having a busy day or you have young children, mm-hmm. there's times that you're going throughout the day and you're 
mind is wandering, you're daydreaming, you're checking off your to-do list in your head, you're making a to-do list in your head, that's not being mindful. And how much of our life should we be focused on being mindful and being present because doing that all the time feels unattainable. Yeah, it is. It is unattainable. And and don't judge yourself for not being able to do it for a long <laughs> period of time. One thing we'll do um, at the beginning of like a DBT session, it's usually a group setting. So it's usually you, uh, me plus maybe four or five other people in the room. We'll try to do just a, one mindfulness activity for five minutes. And what you'll notice is your brain continually goes somewhere else and you must non-judgmentally bring it back to the present moment. It goes again. Now bring it back. It happens very often. And we say it's like a psychological muscle to be able to do this for a long period of time. I think Marsha Linehan would say the more you can be in a mindful state throughout your day, the, the better off you're going to be. Um, it's when you're thinking about the past or you're thinking about the future that a lot of that tension and stress occurs mm -hmm. and um, can derail your thinking patterns. And you don't want that. You you really want to be here present. Um, so we talk a lot about observe, describe, and participate. And those three things break down mindfulness. Observe is only using your senses to notice what's in your environment without words, like no narration in your brain. Just use your eyes, just use your nose, just use your touch. Then describe with words, but do it non-judgmentally. Once again, it's not good. It's not bad. It's white. It's whatever, you, you know, it tastes sweet. It smells like vanilla, whatever that is, but describe it. And then one-mindedly participate in that in thing, that whatever you're doing. Coloring is great for this. Eating is also great for this um, because you can do that one thing fully and you'll notice that there's just so much more peace when mm -hmm. you are mindful in your present moment rather than being pulled backwards into the history or forwards into your future. Um, and I notice it's great with kids because I, the same way, Sarah, I notice that like, I'm always thinking about something else and that's not fair to them. They need my undivided attention um, when they're in my presence. And so they're actually a great way to be mindful. Like, what are they saying and how, what do they look like when they're saying that and, and being mindful to them? So um, I think it's a great, a great skill set to try and practice. I could do a whole episode on DBT because I just <laughs> love it. There's three more modules I don't have to get into right now, but they're emotion regulation module, um, interpersonal effectiveness. I use those skills all the time, all okay. the time. And I, I want to know them. about those. Give a brief overview and then yeah. let's plan on doing a full episode on this because I think yeah. this is really interesting. Oh, and I love it. Like I'll just, I could talk for hours about this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so emotion regulation is learning strategies to identify, understand, um, and manage your emotions effectively. So it helps reduce emotional vulnerability and also impulsivity. So that's something else you see crop up for people is uh, making impulsive decisions. You want to be uh, in the, you know, in a right state of mind emotionally when you're doing, making different decisions. Interpersonal are, are effectiveness. You are you talking about shopping decisions? Yeah, right. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No <laughs> retail therapy here. Um, yeah, no. And then there's interpersonal effectiveness. And this is one of my favorite modules because it's so goal focused. Um, you decide whether your goal is to say your piece and, and have self-respect whether it's to um, be easy and gentle and get along with the person or whether you need to um, have something happen. So there's three different, like different goals you can choose. Like sometimes you just need to say your piece. And after you've said your piece, you have achieved your goal. And that's especially important when you're standing up for yourself, because it doesn't matter what the response is. That's not what we're going to judge. What we're going to judge is whether we achieved our own goal. And I like that a lot. Um, if you want to maintain a goal or maintain a relationship, there are different ways to do that. There are different ways to act. Um, and you're given acronyms for each of these things that tell you um, what the different skills are that go into each. So we'll do, we'll do a whole episode okay. on that. Yeah. And the last Let one is distress tolerance. That's the last module. Getting through the moment um, is super important. So um, surviving crisis, 
um, survival strategies are is going to be what that whole session's about. Sometimes we just need to make it through the present moment, and that's what that's all about. So okay, yeah, I love that. Um, that overview is so educational, and I am constantly learning things from you that. Um, are helpful in my life and in the life of my children. And it makes me wonder, you know, my understanding of a psychologist or a psychiatrist was, you know, I saw a psychologist when I was in college because it was part of the student health program and you you got to go to a number of sessions and they just mm-hmm. kind of helped you transfer into the university. And then that yeah. was kind of it. And then, you know, thinking about, oh, the psychologist from The Sopranos. And, <laughs> and those are like the kind of reference points. But everything yeah. that I'm learning from you is so valuable. And I Thank wonder, you. like, for people who don't have a best friend that's a psychologist. <laughs> but, you no, know, really, like, when should someone see a psychologist or or a psycho- psychiatrist, for that matter? Yeah, I think if if you're experiencing significant distress in any way, that would be a good time to go get some help. If you're going through an interesting or difficult uh, life process, maybe, you know, different periods of time, we go through these different stages and we transition from one thing to the next. And sometimes that's that's a difficult transition for us. Uh, like one, one big one is like, you know, having a kid for the first time, that's a huge transition. It's never a bad idea to have some support during those periods of time. Um, so I would say if, if, if you're noticing your joy is being taken away based on um, the way you're feeling or the way you're thinking, uh, that's a great time. There's a lot of different times. If, if things are hunky dory, you probably don't need the support. Um, it's really when you're feeling like you're going through something and it can be small. It doesn't have to be huge. One nice thing, one thing we notice about therapy is that just addressing one small component that may be giving you trouble has a trickle down effect to all other areas of your life. Mm -hmm. So learning a new skill set, often you can see alleviation of a multitude of different symptoms just by targeting one. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a great, it's a great way to just, you know, we got to do tune-ups for our body. We need to do exercise. We've got to, you know, eat healthy things like that. Also consider your brain the same way, like to do tune-ups, do check-ins with people. Um, if you need support, don't hesitate to look for it. There's, there's lots of sources. Okay. So that, that's perfect. So that's to see a psychologist, <clears throat> right? Mm-hmm. And then and then how would you know if you needed to see a psychiatrist? psychiatrist. Like that's where medication would be prescribed. Like if you're yes. feeling really sad or. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yes, if you're feeling really sad, that's a good time. Um, if you're it, it, really, you can a lot of times in conjunction with your psychologist, seek out the extra support of a psychiatrist. So if I had somebody coming to me and and I could tell that it was a really, maybe it's double depression. Maybe it's something that's really, really severe. I'd say, let's get you on a medication first and then start therapy because the, the medication takes the edge off and then you can actually engage in therapy. And that's what the research actually suggests for very severe depression, that they, the medicine starts first, then you do the, the, the therapy. Most psychologists would know to seek that out for things like depression. Mm-hmm. Anxiety, uh, there's you know mixed re- result, reviews about whether you should be on anxiety medication, and if so, what types you should be on. We can talk to Dr. Rosie about that sometime, <laughs> but a lot of those can be very addictive. And so as a psychologist, if I had an anxious person come to me for therapy, I'd probably hold off on, on telling that person to go get medicine. Now, there are some things some um, conditions that really do need to have a medical intervention for them. Those would include things like bipolar, uh, schizophrenia, the ones that are very, very brain-based where there's no matter amount of therapy I can do for that person. If they are having their neurons misfire on a constant basis and they're seeing and hearing things that aren't there, I can't challenge that, right? Like a lot of my therapy would be like challenging the thought to, to intervene on that emotion. They're seeing and hearing things sometimes that aren't that aren't there, um, and that needs to be medically handled. And that's out of my sort of purview. I would be handing that person off to a psychiatrist, and then if they needed therapy or support 
um, after they're medicated, that would be when I would jump in right there and, and intervene for these different processes that I can access through their okay. thinking pattern. Yeah. That's good to know. Um, with regards to where do you find one? I've been hearing on a lot of podcasts I recent, listened to, one of their sponsors is BetterHelp. So oh, it's like, yeah. reach out to betterhelp.com. Is that a legitimate place to find your psychologist if you think you need one or, yeah. or where should you start? I mean, look online. I, I would say there's a whole process through which I would filter. Um, and I'll just tell you what that is now having the insider knowledge that I have. So number one, I, uh, this is my platinum perspective. So I'm allowed to have this. I might get some <laughs> flack for this, but I would not go to a, uh, somebody who's going to psychoanalyze me. Don't go mm -hmm. to someone who's got that Freudian background, look up the person, make sure you're going to go to a, co a cognitive behavioral therapist, somebody who is trained in CBT for pretty much any diagnosis. That'd be how I would look for somebody. Now, again, if you are um, experiencing things that might line up with bipolar or with schizophrenia, I'd go straight to the psychiatrist. And the way I would do that is I honestly, I would look at Google reviews and look at somebody, find somebody who's got the highest number of reviews with the highest rating, that psychiatrist, that person will probably do. They'll know what to give to you pretty, pretty fast. But if you want therapy, I would be looking for a cognitive, cognitive behavioral orientation. And then the question for you would be, do I want to see somebody who's master's level or somebody who is a PhD level? Mm -hmm. I'm PhD. And then there's also a CID. Um, I'm a PhD, which means that I am a doctor. I am a PhD though, not a CID because my degree included a high level of research. I know research. I know how to consume research. I'm going to stay up on research. And that means my, um, my repertoire of what I'm going to be using to help you is going to be up to date. Um, PsyD is trained much more on just the therapy part of that, not the research part of that. And that's not to knock PsyD. Um, those people are also, I have great friends that are PsyDs, but they're going to have much less research emphasis. And so the question would be like, are you staying up with what's what's new and can you decipher mm -hmm. what's good and what's not now if you um if you just want to see a master's level person that's fine too master's level is just fine for therapy if you want diagnostics and you want it done really well you're going to want to see a psychologist mm -hmm. um you're going to want to see the phd or the the psyd somebody who's going to really dig in and decipher where your symptoms lie what diagnosis most accurately accounts for the symptoms that you're experiencing and can do some differential diagnostics. And that's just not what master's level people are sort of trained in. Um, so okay. I would, because I might, maybe Those I'm a psychologist, I might always be looking for the psychologist, yeah. but that's not to say I haven't used master's level people for different types of um, needs. It just depends on what your need is. Like if, mm. if you need marital therapy, master's level is great. You know, if you need some support, master's level is great. So, um, okay. Th yeah. Those are good tips on finding someone. Um, can I tell you this hilarious story that I just remembered Yeah. as we're talking about this? The last time I saw a psychologist, professional, a professional psychologist, I was in undergraduate school. Okay. And like I mentioned, it was like a program that the school was offering um, to students. And so I took them up on it and it was like, you know, get three sessions with the school psychologist or whatever. Um, and so you didn't go to the same one, maybe because it was part, it might've been part of their graduate program. Okay. Um, so the third time and the final time I went, I go in and it was a gentleman probably in his sixties and we sit down and he's taking a ton of notes and he's asking me all about, you know, my family background and, and family history. And I look down and the dude is wearing two different shoes, <laughs> two different shoes. Feel like, and I was sir. like, I <laughs> like, I know that at the time I'm like a 20 year old and I probably could use some life advice, but yeah. I'm gonna guess you could use some advice too because you yeah. didn't even put your shoes on right. <laughs> oh my uh, god, so I never went back. <laughs> oh, okay, so two things one, kudos for them giving sessions like that to, to students who are just starting and um, <laughs> an undergrad. That is when you see a ton of stuff crop up, um, depression, anxiety, concerning behaviors, risky behavior. Uh, so 
I think that that's great that they're trying. I think that's what they were trying to do probably is flag people that are really at risk. Um, and you were probably were not that person. The thing that um, you would never see if you go see a psychologist or a, a, any therapist is switching uh, the therapist because the alliance between you and the client matters a lot and the trust mm -hmm. that you build from session to session to session so that they open up and they can tell you their problems. Mm -hmm. You don't get that if you're switching all the time. So mm -hmm. I would say that would be like the biggest the biggest problem I saw there as part of my degree, I did have to go, I had to have a, a, a therapist for half a year. I want to say it was part of my practicum. It's like, I had to, I had to seek therapy from somebody and it was somebody in our cl own clinic. So I trusted this person. I knew mm -hmm. this person anyways, but uh, it was amazing. I was like, I was so empowered in those sessions and I grew so cl close to the the person who was helping me through a bunch of stuff. Um, so I, I know it can be done really well. I know also know it can be done really poorly. If there's a bad fit initially between you yeah. and that, that just quit, go somewhere else to find someone else who aligns <laughs> better with you. Cause you need a therapeutic alliance. Um, the third thing I'll add to that is that, so my orientation, we don't dig into your history. I mean, I might ask you about your history, but it's more for garnering, like just gathering information at the front end to understand who you are. We're not going to spend a lot of time in your childhood. Like I'm not going to be talking to you a ton. I'm going to be talking about things that are happening right now, because what we know is that treating what happens right now is going to help you feel better right now. The Freudian part of that would be talking about your childhood for a long period of time. Oh. They they uncover all these processes. They're, mm -hmm. you know, um, to me, it seems very mystical, but they're going to talk a lot about why you think now is related to how you were back when you were a child and the way you were treated and oh, interesting. maybe I, your, all that stuff. I can't stuff. even remember what we were talking about because I just kept looking at like, you're Dude, like, you have a brown sir. shoe and a black <laughs> shoe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was colorblind. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, That's maybe. funny. Yeah, I don't know. But you would notice it's not the same shoe, I'm sure, if you're looking. Um, yeah, it's important for your your therapist to like present themselves in a way that's like, okay, I trust you. You seem like you're you've got it together. Otherwise, it's like, why am I taking your advice? Right. Yeah. Um, okay, moving on to kind of a fun question we had talked about before. Um what are some things that your psychologist is thinking when a patient is in the room and they're not telling you? So if you have a psychologist, I'm always wondering, like, what is that psychologist thinking about their patient, but they wouldn't ever tell you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it so matters, like, who the patient is. Um, I've had many thoughts about many patients. I <laughs> would say, um, you know, the first thing I'm trying to do is stay one step ahead of you. I, I am always thinking to myself, I hear what you're saying and where do I need to steer this person next? What's the next therapeutic thing I can do with this person? Where's the next place we're going to go? And so you can always sort of see the gears turning probably because you're, you have something, it, it, sometimes it's so clear that somebody's in your, in your room and they're telling you something. And you're like, I know exactly what we got to do, but then how do I get that person to go there? Some mm -hmm. people are super unmo unmotivated. I, I remember one, um, one a semester I was in school and I was working in the clinic. I was assigned everybody who was court referred meaning they got in trouble and then the court said you need therapy. Most of the time, this was because the person had been arrested for DUI or had some sort of substance use problem. People who have that and then they get referred, meaning they have to go as part of their sentence, oh. they're not motivated to be there with you. They're not motivated to work on the problem. And so you, the whole time, you're just thinking to yourself, how do I motivate this person to want to make any sort of change? And the whole therapy ended up being building motivation. Oh, That's it. Wow, It was like not even intervening. And then the person was like done after four sessions because they only got sentenced to four sessions. Oh. Um, so it's, it really depends. And then other people come to you, like depressed patients come to you. They really want to make a change, but they physically can't move their body because they're so depressed, things like that. Oh. And so where's the next intervention for that person's probably different than somebody who comes in and they're anxious and they really want to take care of it and they're high functioning. So I think that's the big one. The other big thing, and this is maybe um, triggering, hopefully not, but we're always wondering about CYA, cover your behind. 
we need to take really thorough good notes and we need to be assessing for um, risk for harm at pretty much every other session, even if you're low risk. This surprises a lot of people because they're like, why are you asking me if I want to hurt myself? And why are you doing it so often? Uh, and people get turned off of therapy because of this question. The reason we're asking is because if we don't and something happens, then our licenses are on the line mm -hmm. and we need of to have course. taken thorough notes that we asked and this was the response, mm -hmm. period. Um, and so that's the other thing we're always wondering, we know, assessing how dangerous is the situation and how on top of it do I need to be um, so that nothing bad happens. Okay. That's so interesting. You know, yeah. as you were talking about that, you're always assessing, <laughs> it's you know, it's intimidating being best friends with you because sometimes <laughs> let's just let's just lay it out there. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder, I'm like, oh my gosh, is she assessing like my the decisions I'm making, the mental health choices that oh. I you know, you wonder that. And I know as I introduce you to some of my friends, you know, it's kind of like, this is my new best friend and she's a psychologist. And that's a constant theme that people kind of wonder like what is a psychologist thinking about people they meet that are not their patients? That's such a good question. I, I do quick reads on people. I'll admit this. I, I do very fast reads on people and um, things, because I come from a personality background, things kind of smack me in the face when it's, it's going to be a problem or not. Um, but I also know how, because I'm a psychologist, how to navigate that stuff and just stay away from it. Um, so it's, it's pretty clear sometimes when something's going to be a hot topic for somebody or um, you can tell, like, I, I, to I totally, so this is really like rudimentary, but I see people as like approach or avoid, like that's mm -hmm. like one thing, like, are you approach or are you avoid? Um, and, and um I'm trying to think of other reductionistic sort of things I do, but I can notice personality pretty quickly. Um, and that's just because of my training, but I don't always do that because I'm trying to diagnose somebody. I'm just that. And naturally aware. I'm aware and I am interested intrinsically in what that person looks like and what, how they act and things like that. And, um, then based on that, either I sort of like really want to be hanging out with you and I want to be your friend or maybe like, maybe not, maybe we're just going <laughs> to be acquaintances and that's totally just fine, you know, but it's just probably the same way you evaluate people also. Like you look for these qualities, you look maybe for moral character, you look for, are you fun and, mm -hmm. um, things like that, that that's probably the same sort of filter I'm using, except like I have like different, I don't know rudimentary sort of, I don't know, not rudimentary, but like systems that I use <laughs> that are based on the way I was trained. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah. So, so should I feel um, really good about my mental yeah, health? You should. <laughs> if I wasn't in a good place, you would have stopped being friends with me. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. You're, 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 I mean, you guys are so great in so many ways, but the thing that really stood out to me about you is you're so kind and, um, and positive. And, um, those are things I look forward to. I want to, I want to be friends with people that are upbeat and fun. I want to have fun. I know you do too. That's why we get along. Yeah. Right? Um, but we are different, right? Like you're much more outgoing than me. I'm much more introverted, but I assume a virtue. So we're all good there. Um, yeah. So oh, I love it. Well, let's go to the next question. Cause let's sure. not turn this into a one-on-one -on -one therapy Kinda. session. No. <laughs> um, Another popular topic right now in psychology is nature versus nurture. So in the debate between nature, which is genetics, and nurture, the environment, what does modern psychology tell us about their roles in shaping our personalities and behavior? Yeah, so we have so many new tools and interesting tools to use to understand the nature versus nurture question. This is sort of an age old question of, are you born with it or do you acquire it through environment? And there are interesting answers to this. I mean, I'd say based on all of the tools we have these days, most things are 50-50. Most things, you're, you have a predisposition for certain things, including positive things like personality. And then your environment is going to be shaping that along the way. Where it becomes really interesting, and I think where modern psychology has gone with some of this, is that the interesting thing is that environment changes your 
genes, which is crazy, right? So you're born with these genes and that's your sort of the nature part of it, right? That's a, it's a, like your DNA, but there's a new field. It's not really new anymore, but it was newer when I was in grad school called epigenetics. And this is the field where it studies, well, if you go through an experience, your genes get flipped on or off based on the experience. And so now we're starting to understand more and more nuance about why things come to occur. You can also do really fun things. I mean, fun for people who like statistics like me. Um, and you can get twins and you can do twin studies and you can look and see, uh, you know, for a certain diagnosis. I studied psychopathy a lot. There's a lot of cool twin studies out there about the um, heritability of something like psychopathy. And uh, we were able to tell, it, especially in kids, that it was a little bit more heritable than it was environmental. Mm -hmm. um, but once you get to adulthood, it's, it gets more back to the 50-50 because environment's mm -hmm. playing more and more of a role on your genes as you get older. So um, it's really interesting. Um, there's a lot of cool tools out there for researching that. But again, we keep coming back to most, even if it comes back, I know there's a study for psychopathy. It came back that it was 0.81 heritable. Uh, and that was in a kid sample of, um, twins. And it's interesting because that, that's a really, really high number. It's out of just one. So 0.81 is pretty high. Um, subsequent studies came out though, showing it's much lower. So yeah, you have to do a lot of these studies to sort of come around to the same conclusion, which is like 50, 50. <laughs> basically. <laughs> so, um, I'm wondering though, if something is heritable, so it is nature mm -hmm. can, nurture counteract that like if you have yeah. a genetic predisposition mm -hmm. for mental illness mm -hmm. can your environment um make it so that doesn't show theoretically yes so um for something like super heritable something that's really heritable is schizophrenia let's just use that one there's a two hit hypothesis out there and there's a lot of research to support this. And that is that you're born with the predisposition and then you have two environmental hits that occur, usually one when you're a baby and one when you're a little bit older. And that if you have the predisposition and you have the two hits, then you will express the, what we call phenotype of uh, schizophrenia. So if you don't have those two hits and you grow up in a very, very nurturing, wonderful environment, theoretically, you wouldn't be turning those switches to then have the outcome, if that makes any oh, sense. Yes, yes. So, yeah. Which it would make sense because it would make sense that the way you are raised and the love that you're receiving and the um, stability that you have will affect your mental health overall. Yeah. Um, when you mentioned epigenetics, is is it possible? Um, I feel like I read something that was talking about that something that is from your parents or your grandparents can be passed down through epigenetics. Now, is that different than having a genetic predisposition or is that the same thing? That's the same. Yeah. Okay. Which is crazy, right? So yes, yes, some of the tags that your parents have and your grandparents have, you can, you can actually study this like through famines. They've studied famines and then looked at the tags throughout yeah. generations. They persist. Um, and so, yeah, I think between like two and three generations before they kind of wash out, um, yeah. which is interesting. So your parents' experiences and your grandparents' experiences are sometimes passed on to you and that will affect your biology. Right. I think I read something with this um, in relation to um, the, de the Great Depression. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. that's a big study. That was yes. a big one where they found okay. this. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. So how would you see that materialize? Like if your grandparents were, you know, you or great grandparents were a part of that, how are you seeing that materialize in, in your life now? Um, so it's really interesting if somebody goes through famine, so then their body learns that they need to hoard calories. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, if, if somebody went through the great depression and they had nothing, then their body's going to say, I mean, this is really interesting actually. So there's like this theory called life history theory. And it's that basically when you're going through very, very stressful environments like that, maybe you're having 
actual calorie restriction because you don't have enough food, um, that your body's going to say, hurry up, grow up fast and hoard your calories like crazy. So you might see these people further on down the line that have a propensity for being overweight, but their grandparents actually went through the famine. And it's because their body is saying, hold on to those calories. We're not letting those things go. We might need those. Um, and yeah. hurry up and grow up so that you can procreate sooner and faster before you die. So it's like this idea that like there's going to be an earlier death or your body or your cells sort of have this growth pattern that, that to, to protect against that, we're going to hurry up and we're going to procreate. So you see a lot of things come along with that too, like earlier sex behavior and um, yeah, things like that. So it's, it's interesting, the grow up part of it, earlier puberty. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's the stress that an individual went through, it gets embedded into their genetics and is passed down from generation to generation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that old wow. like generational curses sort of thing that maybe you've heard we've heard of before. There is some evidence that indeed not curses, but just the the experiences are held on through generations. Wow. Yeah. So no no pressure on us for how we're living our life for future generations. I know. I know. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, let's switch gears a little bit. You've talked a bit about sleep being mm-hmm. related to mental health. Um, I have been fortunate enough to not have sleep issues, but I know that you have gone through that. Um, mm-hmm. So, And I know a lot of other people who struggle with sleep as well. Would you share a little bit about how is that related to mental health? Yeah. So um, I feel like we see sleep problems when it comes to anxiety and depression, potentially with, you know, bipolar or schizophrenia also, but um, also some people just have sleep problems. Um, And yeah, sleep is super um, linked to the quality of sleep is linked to your emotional health. Um, throughout the day. So you can imagine how if you're having a lot of sleep problems, or you're not sleeping through the night, or maybe you don't have sleep, good sleep hygiene, we can talk about that for a moment, how that can actually spin off into something bigger if you don't address it to begin with. So um, a big thing we talk about, especially when it comes to like depression, because they tend to have people who are depressed tend to have a lot of sleep problems, either they're sleeping way, way, way too much, or they're not sleeping enough. It's either one or the other usually. And so what we want to talk about are things like um, sleep hygiene. And that includes making sure that your room is pitch black at night. You want it to be completely black in your room. You want it to be cold. You want to have the right setting so that you have, it's most conducive to falling asleep. Things like screens before Uh, bedtime actually activate your brain and tell it to be awake. And so reducing screen time before bedtime can be a big one. Going to bed at the same time every night, waking up at the same time every single morning. um, Those are big, big, big. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of things you can do just to regulate that sleep. And if somebody comes into your office and they're, they're displaying some symptoms of depression, that's usually the first place I'll start is how is your sleep? And let's talk about that first, because that just that can take the edge off enough so that the person can like engage in therapy. Um, so sleep hygiene is like a huge topic that, um, people need to attend to and, and the caffeine is another one. Um, you know, being careful about your caffeine intake, things like that, things that can keep you awake. Um, of course that makes sense. I'm actually like thinking back to right after you have a newborn baby and your sleep is so disruptive and how, um, I, my neighbors kept texting me after my first daughter was born that the trunk of my car was open. And I couldn't believe that multiple times I was leaving the trunk of my car open and it was such a silly thing because usually that's not something I would ever do. And I was relating it back to being sleep deprived that I just was forgetting to do this like Mm -hmm. very mundane task that I had never forgotten to do previously in my life. But um, I think because I was so exhausted. So it, it does make sense when you're exhausted, you're just not functioning properly or at the the highest level that you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it can definitely. And when I think about like postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety, I think about the role of sleep. I mean, I think 
we think it's such a hormonal thing. It's just these hormones are changing and you got to, their body's adjusting. It's also sleep deprivation. Let's be honest. Like that's got to be fueling some of that, that we see. I know it did for me. Like I, I went through like no sleep with my second child and I did not feel well. So I just remember how hard that was. It's a really tough yeah. time. Yeah. So prioritizing sleep is key. Yeah. Um, I'd love to ask you about technology and social media, because I know you have some good information on this. How has so, like social media specifically influenced our mental health? And then what should we think about when we're thinking about this with the younger generations? Yeah, I think... I think that we all we all know that social media has had these sort of detrimental links to mental health and well-being and I think it's just that you have so many other things to compare your life to out there now that people didn't used to have that input. There are so many people out there living their best lives on social your social media, Instagram, things like that. People look a certain way. There's all of this input and um I think as adults you know, it, it's not good to be on social media a ton just because of that. Like it, it tends to lead to negative self-valuation the longer that you're on social media, but also it's so important for children. So as kids reach puberty, their hormones turn on and those hormones make it so that they're much more attuned to social hierarchy. They are mm -hmm. always evaluating where they stand compared to other people. And that's biologically built in. That's what they're mm -hmm. going to go through that, whether we want them to or not. Now add on top of that social evaluation threat piece, all the input that they get from, from Instagram and all the input mm -hmm. they're getting from social media and just media in general. We used to have magazines, right? That was the big problem for us. We had these gorgeous women on magazines. You'd open the magazine and it's, oh, I don't look like that. They have so many more inputs like that now. And I think that's why you see um, significantly increased rates of um, mental health problems in adolescents these days compared to the past because they have so much to deal with. And to be honest, like their brain functioning is not at the adult level yet. Their prefrontal cortex, which is what helps them filter, is not fully formed to you're 28 years old. So you have wow. from puberty, which yes. is like 12 to 28 to build that part of your brain and have it be fully formed and functioning so that you can, you know, manage all this input that you're experiencing and, and sort it and, and deal with it. And we've got mm -hmm. that and kids don't have that. Um, and they have that added, added pressure, uh, added pressure makes them do things that are risky. Um, so that's side the side question on that. If something happens or risky behaviors are taking place before the brain is um, fully formed, so before 28, mm -hmm. can that alter the way that your brain is formed and follow you throughout your life? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, wow. So what we know about youth is that they are, uh, especially between the ages of like 12 and 18, when they're going through puberty, they are going to be seeking out new information and they are going to be taking more risks than normal because number one, testosterone is higher. And number two, they have that social evaluation threat piece always going. They're evaluating their friends, their friends are evaluating them. And the kids who are higher status tend to do more risky things. And so they are, their brains are also expectant of these new experiences, these, and to take risks. They, their brain is looking and hungry for it. So it's our job then as parents and educators and whomever else is involved with that, that sector of youth is to provide them with healthy, positive risk-taking experiences. And this is a strange concept. I remember when I started studying this, I was like, what do you mean positive risk-taking? Like, isn't all risk-taking bad, but it's not. Things like um, running for student government, things like um, sports, especially if you have a physically risky behavior sort of child, which I may or may not have one of those myself who <laughs> likes to take risks, providing them with an outlet where they can do that safely mm -hmm. is going to fill okay. that need. And the brain is looking for it and hungry for it. If you don't feed it with the good stuff, it's going to be fed with the bad stuff. And then, mm -hmm. yes, that can absolutely change that brain functioning. Everything is changing during puberty for the brain at both 
um, the organization and the activation patterns that are occurring are all shifting and changing during puberty. So the things you encounter and do during that period of time make a big difference in the trajectory. Wow. So, yeah. That's so fascinating. Oh, social media is terrifying it um, is. as yeah. parents. As I parents. know. I love it as a mom. No. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, well, so ultimately, I think that we all are just looking to lead the happiest, most successful life that we can, full of satisfaction. What does um, psychology research tell us about leading that type of life? Yeah, I think um, it's there's, this is a really interesting topic um, and a great, a great question. I, I think what the research has shown is that the more sort of intrinsically happy we are and, and um, satisfied, the better, rather than finding um, like external circumstances or material possessions that um, maybe lead to happiness in the moment, but not long term. Um, and so it's an influence by like our attitudes, our mindset, social connectivity really matters a lot for positive psychology and positive thinking processes. Um, the more disengaged you get, and I think we saw this a lot during the pandemic, the more disengaged we get, um, the more we see negative thought patterns kind of come in. And so keeping that, those relationships alive, healthy, putting effort towards those relationships and maintaining them really matters. And it's hard to do when you're feeling maybe a little bit depressed and things, but mm -hmm. pushing through that and continuing to connect with people is really important. Another um, big piece that's been researched that I think is really interesting is um, the idea of gratitude mm -hmm. um, and, and, and having a positive gratitude. Uh, thought process of gratitude is like really, really important to having a positive outlook, thinking of things in your environment that you're grateful for and, and thinking on that rather than thinking on the things you don't have or thinking on what you want to have changed, um, that that can give a lot of peace to somebody as well. And then lastly, like mindfulness, again, we're going to come back to that probably many, many times at practicing mm -hmm. mindfulness and living in the moment. Um, in the present moment can enhance overall happiness by reducing, you know, excessive worry, um, thinking about the past and um, having a more like holistic approach to your life. Um, that's, you know, you're living fully to the most that you can. That leads to a lot of happiness as well. Oh, that makes sense. I feel like I experienced that in my own life, that whenever you start to express gratitude for what you have, it, you immediately feel happier. It's immediate. Yeah. Um, which is so great. Um, right. So I'm also wondering how do, um, how do like cognitive biases affect our decision making process? And then how can we overcome that to make mm -hmm. better choices for our life? Yeah. So cognitive biases are sneaky. They're so, <laughs> so sneaky. And um, they do affect our decision-making processes in ways that if we are aware of them, that we can um, we can make better decisions if we can identify them and then push them out before we make our decision. Um, so decision-making is a fundamental aspect of um, human cognition. It's, in, it's influenced by cognitive biases, which are like sort of systemic errors in thinking that can lead to suboptimal choices. Um, so they're a product of our brain's effort to sort of simplify complex information, make a quick decision, not spend so much time on every single thing, sort of like heuristics. Um, one common bias that we see a lot is confirmation bias, where we sort of like looked and seek out information and interpret information that confirms our existing ideas rather and to sort of like ignore contradictory evidence. We see this a lot and this leads to really poor decision-making, um, mm -hmm. and reinforces sort of preconceived notions rather than allowing yourself to have an open mind. Um, another one is like availability heuristic, which occurs when we overestimate the importance of information that's readily available to us. Um, so maybe we hear about a rare event in the news. Actually, this might pertain to sort of school shootings, potentially, oh. but one of our previous topics, but mm -hmm. 
it's very available in the news and then we perceive it to be more common than we than it actually is statistically mm. for me it's probably planes right any yeah. anytime <laughs> i read about turbulence i'm like every plane's gonna have turbulence and it's gonna go down but the the reality is like it's very unlikely to have a plane go down or crash or anything like that but right. because there's one or two instances in history, then I, you know, I can think about that instead. And it causes <laughs> me to have a bad, you know, bad vibe about it. There's a whole bunch of those. Um, you know, there's the, I'm sure you've heard of Dunning-Kruger, the Dunning-Kruger effect, like when people overestimate people of low ability or knowledge um, in a particular domain will overestimate their ability. It's the people who are very, very highly skilled um, that tend to underestimate their confidence. So, oh, yeah, so you know, the more knowledgeable <laughs> or like informed you are about a topic, the more sort of skeptical you are and um, don't trust your own judgment, <laughs> which is, oh, oh my gosh, <laughs> interesting. Oh, that reminds me of that like Megan Trainer song where she's like, you think you're, you always Oh yeah, you're so, you're so strong in what you say, even when you're wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. You think you're so right just because you're loud. It's yes. like, well, that's, yeah, exactly okay. right. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. I think if, if people look up cognitive biases on their own, there's probably 20 of them that you can go read about, but they're very interesting. They're well-researched. Um, you see them all the time. So the more we know about them, the more we can avoid them when we're making our decisions. Wow. Okay. So interesting. So one last question, and I know, I think we are potentially going to do an entire episode on this at a later date. And this is not in our notes, everyone. I'm going to surprise you <laughs> with this. <laughs> but we talk a lot about perfectionism um, because I think that it's something that's really common in moms and in women our age, perfectionistic tendencies. Yeah. Um, so could you just give like a brief overview on that? And maybe how we should be working on that um, to lead a happier life. Yeah, I would be happy to. Uh, Yeah, so perfectionism is um, holding yourself up to a bar, basically a perfection, and expecting yourself to achieve that. And what we know about people is that nobody's perfect. And the more that we expect that of ourselves, the more judgment we're going to feel about about that and about ourselves. Um, again, we are our own worst critics. We see ourselves often way more negatively than anybody else would see us. And that goes for most people, but especially for people who are perfectionistic. Um, it can lead to so much unhappiness to hold yourself to that standard when everyone else around you doesn't see you the way that you see yourself, you know? And so if, if that's the case, wouldn't it be better to be aligned with everybody else and see yourself how they see you, which is just going to have a lot less, you know, distance between reality and what we we perceive. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the sad thing about people for people who are very, very perfectionistic is that everyone else sees them as doing great and but they don't see themselves that way. And um, the perfectionism, like the perfectionism, is linked to a couple of interesting disorders. But one of them is anorexia. Um, so that's the disorder where you stop eating. Um, you expect yourself to look a certain way. We see uh, a, a lot of perfectionism in that trait in anorexia, and it's just because they are expecting themselves to be stick thin, and nobody is. Nobody is stick thin. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think. I think identifying parts, maybe parts of your life, if you have this tendency, where are you, where are you holding the rubric too high? And is that stealing some of your joy? Um, Because I would imagine that it would. I I know I have some perfectionism. I know you do. We've talked about that. Like, um, we don't want it to steal our joy. And sometimes, actually, this is one good thing I learned in grad school. They used to say, bees make PhDs. You don't (laughs) have to be perfect to to be good, right? Like you, like not everybody has to be straight A's and that's okay. Not everybody has to be perfect. And actually, if we stopped comparing ourselves to perfectionism or perfect ideals, we would see that we're, we're doing really well. Like we're, we're just fine, you know? So evaluating yourself correctly matters for, um, you know, happiness and health. And, you know, one thing you see for depression, which is interesting is that they tend to 
they tend to be much more negative. And um, if you have depressive depressive symptoms, you are more negative in the way that you view your environment. You are actually more correct, yes, um, when you're thinking like that. You, you're seeing things a lot more for what they are rather than what we want them to be. But what we know is effective for living a happy life is not seeing things like that. We want to over over optimize. We want to see things as a little bit better than they are. That gives us a lot more hope and joy. Mm, so, like having like seeing things through rose colored glasses. Exactly. Yeah, we yeah. want we want that. We want to see that that way because that's going to give us more happiness and joy. So, do we want to be right or do we want to be happy? You know, <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of the question. I'd rather be happy um, and be good with you know, and I'd hope that for my clients too that they'd they'd want to be happy with themselves and, and, uh, you know, be grateful, you know, for, for yes. what the things that they are for their yeah. own identity. So, yeah, I love that. Well, gosh, Dr. Megan, this has been <laughs> a great session. Yay. I'll see you next week. No. Okay. <laughs> no, this has been fabulous. This has been such a great overview, kind of a little psychology 101 deep dive. Yeah. Um, and let's do this again because I think there's quite a few more topics that would be fun to get into a little bit deeper. Um, but this is a sure. great base. You're so brilliant on all Aww, of this. Um, thank you, Sarah. Let's jump into some takeaways. Okay. So first, definitely, um, if you're feeling any type of sadness or, or anything that's not allowing you to live your life the way you want to be living it go ahead and seek out a therapist and you want to find one that's rooted in cognitive behavioral approaches. Mm -hmm. um, also <clears throat> look up mindfulness techniques. Um, even if you aren't in therapy, they improve the quality of your life. And I know you taught me these early on in our friendship and I use them all the time. So oh, it's good. Brilliant. Yeah, me too. Um, and then what else should we add in here? What's another takeaway for our listeners? Um, well, let's, let's make one maybe about the perfectionism piece. You know, if you're prone to perfectionistic tendencies, give yourself a break. I would say one huge thing everyone can do for themselves is remove judgment about yourself. Mm -hmm. Like start actually just describing the situation you're in with, you know, qualitative words rather than saying something's good or bad or that we're good or bad. Um, things are what they are and we have more information when we actually describe them appropriately rather than having a lot of judgment in there. Oh, I love that. I love that. That's yeah. perfect. Yay. Well, this was Yay. so much fun. Yes, it was. It was a blast. Um, so everyone, that's all for this episode of Platinum Perspective. And thank you for listening. Tune in every week for more beauty, psychology, luxury, and travel. Please tell your friends to rate, like, and subscribe. Bye.